Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to head over to the motherland of Scotland once again and we're going to have a look at a beer from another brewery that I've never tried anything from before. So these guys are another relatively new addition to the Scottish beer scene and having had a look through some of the different beers that they do, it seems that these guys just like to brew really random stuff. So I have to say I'm really looking forward to trying some of the kind of crazier beers that these guys do. But the one that we're going to have a look at today is, I guess, one of the more kind of simple and straight shooting beers, if we can put it that way. It's a style that I very much enjoy, and it also came as a recommendation from my friend Billy Walker, also known as Bilko, from Bilko and Brenny's podcast. So a big shout out to him. So this is one that he recommended to me, actually. So yeah, very curious to see what this one is going to have in store for us. So hopefully it's another good beer. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review, and as always, I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one as well. Always nice to introduce new Scottish breweries to you here on Rampant Lion Reviews. So uh, yeah, for this review then, we are going to head through to Glasgow once again. We're going to go to the south side of the city, and we're going to have a look at my first beer from Simple Things Fermentations. So this one comes from their Big Ideas series. It's number 26. And it's simply called West Coast IPA. So uh, yeah, an old school California West Coast, whatever you want to call it, IPA coming in at 7.2% ABV. And it's got a nice hop bill on it, but we'll come to that a little bit later on. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, I bought this beer at, uh, it was either The Cave or uh, Valhalla's Goat, I think, in Glasgow that I bought this one. But uh, yeah, I think it only cost me about £4 sterling or something like that. But yeah, they had quite a few different things there from uh, from simple things fermentation so yeah it'd be definitely cool to try a few of the more random beers a little bit later on but let's crack on with this one then and see how we go so as always with my reviews then i'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer if you want to get straight to the tasting just fast forward all the usual links are in the video description below that's the brewery website the link to my other reviews that hopefully i can do in the future from simple things fermentations this is the very first time i'm trying one of their beers i've, I've mentioned already but there's all the usual social media down there uh, if you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The whole channel, of course, has a geography-based tagging system, so you can go into the homepage and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, province, prefecture, whatever it is you happen to be interested in. Do check out the playlist of beers from different countries. There is one there for all the Scottish beers that I've reviewed for you, and that's being added to whenever I get the opportunity, usually when I go back to the motherland of Scotland, of course. And as always, please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely, hugely appreciated. So anyway, on to my brewery notes then to tell you a little bit about Simple Things Fermentations. So Simple Things Fermentations, as I've mentioned to you already, is based in Southside in Glasgow and the company was founded by Phil Sisson. So he had been in the music business for a long time and he ran the Strong Room Recording Studio in Shoreditch in London. But he was also a quite an avid home brewer and he actually won the Great British Homebrew Challenge back in 2016, which offered him the chance to brew a beer at Thornbridge Brewery and then have the beer distributed to Waitrose stores across the UK. So the beer that he won this with was called Raindrops on Roses and it was a 5.3% Belgian wit with rose petals in it and it had things like you know chamomile and, uh, and honey and stuff like this if I remember correctly but apparently this was a beer that really just kind of blew the judges away and that success was really what was one of the things that kind of spurred him to become a professional brewer. So Phil is originally from Cumbria in the northwest of England but his wife is from Fife in eastern Scotland so they moved to Glasgow in late 2016 to be kind of between their families having lived in London for the prior 20 years but when they moved to Glasgow Phil wasn't sure exactly what career move he was going to make but as we said earlier, he'd been a home brewer for a while and so he ended up applying to the Harriet Watt Brewing and Distilling Programme and just kind of took it from there. But he really enjoyed his time at Harriet Watt and during his time studying there, he was also involved in the Natural Selection Programme, which is a, a thing they do in conjunction with Stuart Brewing where the students basically create a beer, it's brewed at Stuart Brewing and then it goes out to market. So he was involved and that and the beer did very well from what I understand. I still need to try a few things from uh, from the natural selection range because they appear every so often and then they just disappear 
quite quickly actually. Um, but after graduating, Phil went on to work for one of my local breweries, Harveston Brewery in Alloa, before branching out on his own. Uh, and he officially founded Simple Things in 2019. But basically, he wants to brew really kind of unusual styles of beer. And uh, these form the basis of the Big Ideas series that he does. Although there are things like this one that are a little bit more kind of uh, straight shooting, if we can say. One of the most unusual beers that I've seen from them so far is the Petite Pale Ale. So that is one that I really want to try. Because as you know, if you've watched the channel for any length of time, I'm a huge fan of Pete. And I do have one of their uh, Scotch ales, actually. But I'll have a look at when I go back to Scotland as well. Um, but the brewery itself can be found in the Muirhead area. In, or Muir End area, sorry, in the south side of Glasgow. And it's located in an old Victorian workshop that was apparently built originally as a bakehouse. But the brew kit comes from PwC Systems and they've basically just been building up the brewery infrastructure over the last few years. But they really only started to get going when the whole kind of pandemic kicked off. So a lot of the early uh, recognition that this brewery got was simply through word of mouth. But of course, the world is opening up again and things are going quite nicely. But as of March 2022, when I'm filming this review for you, these guys have produced around 40 different kinds of beer. And as I say, they do a whole host of uh, different styles, actually. But yeah, this is one that really just kind of stuck out to me because it was a Scottish brew that I hadn't tried. It was a West Coast IPA. And uh, this is a style that I think is getting neglected a little bit. Uh, in recent times I have to say but uh, yeah that is all I can tell you about Simple Things Fermentations for the moment again if you want to learn more about these guys you can check out the brewery website you can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on and you can check out the Rate Beer Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that these guys have done and as I say this is one of the Scottish breweries I will be keeping, at, keeping an eye out for when I go back home to the motherland of Scotland. So um, yeah, that's it. Let's crack on and have a little look at the beer itself. So I'll just let you have a wee look at the artwork on this one before we open it up. As you can see, it's got two kind of uh, things to it, if you like, this sort of symbol on the side here. I'm not sure actually which one is the uh, is supposed to be the front of the can, to be quite honest with you. But uh, yeah, this is the STF, this kind of symbol here is the thing that's more kind of associable if we can say that with um, with the brewery, if you like. That seems to be this one here is their main kind of symbol. But yeah, 440 milliliter can. It tells you a little bit on the front of the beer. So this is a tribute to the big and beautifully balanced hoppy IPAs that ignited the craft beer scene at the start of the century. We used Columbus, Chinook, Centennial, Summit and Amarillo hops to deliver the requisite bitterness and a hefty charge of floral, fruity, piney goodness that floats atop the sweet pale malt. So uh, yeah, we know all of these hops fairly well. Some it not as well right enough. So yeah, Columbus, about, they're all American of course, but Columbus is about 12% alpha acid. It gives you that big kind of spicy floral aromaticity. Chinook uh, is quite a piney resinous one. I think that's maybe a bit more at 14% alpha acid, but it gives you that big piney resinous note and a big kind of quite pungent grapefruit. Centennial I think is about 12-13% alpha acid and that's a big kind of lemony character. Summit if I remember correctly is um, about 12 or 13 percent alpha acid too and it can give you a kind of it gives you a little bit of a kind of passion fruity mango -y sort of thing if memory serves me correctly and Amarillo one of my favorite hops that's about 12 percent alpha acid as well and it gives you a big kind of zesty oily orangey character. So uh, yeah all the hops in this one are pretty old school and I'm familiar with all of them to quite a, a, a good degree, although some it maybe not quite as much as the others. But uh, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, this is number 26 in the Big Ideas series and it is a 7.2% West Coast IPA. So let's crack this guy open and we'll see how we get on then. I'm very curious to see what this is going to have in store for us. I'm going to say the whiff that I got of this just as it, um, as it opened up there was very, very... Nice. So let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the tasting. So Bilko told me this is a nice old school West Coast IPA, but it does have a little bit of a kind of twist to it, he said. So we'll need to have a look at it and just see what that actually is. But yeah, let's take a proper look at this. So before the head disappears, because it is going to disappear quite quickly, we can see that this one poured with about a quarter finger of a frothy, I would say just very slightly off-white head. It's got a nice kind of thicker ring around the edge of the glass and just a little thin kind of foamy layer around the, um, and a, a little thin foamy layer just over the top of it, but it looks very, very nice. 
Um, but in terms of colour, this beer is absolutely beautiful. I'm not sure how well that's going to show up on the uh, the camera, of course, there. Um, because the screen always goes a little bit darker when I film in the evenings, that's the thing. But yeah, this beer, you can see it's poured a lovely kind of medium sort of amber colour, I would say, almost like a blood orange colour. We have seen IPAs that are a bit darker than this, of course, from the West Coast side of things, but it looks absolutely lovely. There's one or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass, a few little ones going up toward the bottom of the head there. But I mean, overall, it does look very nice, a lovely, very kind of rich amber colour. So, uh, yeah, it looks absolutely great, I have to say. So, remember, the colour of your beer depends on, one, the type of malts that you use. This goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. Um, two, the length of your wort boil is also going to play a role, because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugars caramelise, thus you get a darker colour of beer. Any barrel aging that you do or any adjuncts that you put in will affect the colour of the beer too, but when it comes to um, West Coast IPAs, you don't really have to care about that all that often but uh, yeah it does look pretty nice this beer I have to say I do like how this one yeah I do like how this one goes together in uh, in that sense so um, yeah I like it I certainly do like how this one looks it has the appearance of a proper old school West Coast IP and you can see it has that kind of natural hazy sort of thing to it so nothing else we really need to say about the appearance of this beer I think we should go on and have a little look at the aroma before we taste it. So, let's do it. Oh, that does smell very nice. Now, I'm going to say this one. It really does have that kind of nostalgia, nostalgia factor. I mean, back in the day, the beer that really got me into the West Coast IPAs was the um, the hardcore IPA from Brewdog. And you, you can still get it in the form of Mr. President. Through, um, through Tesco and things like that. But this is very, very nice, I have to say. I'm going to say, this, this the aroma that you get out of this straight away is just so nostalgic. It's got everything you would want from this style. Now, one thing I would want to point out with West Coast IPAs is that, in my opinion, there are two sort of ways that this style can lead. You can get the ones that are a little bit more kind of bready and uh, kind of biscuity, McVitie's Digestive, a la the... Um, the Plain of the Elder from Russian River, or you can get the ones that are a little bit more kind of oily and caramelly, such as the Sierra Nevada Torpedo. Uh, this one is really somewhere in the middle of, of it. It's got a little bit of everything. So for me, this is going to be very, very nice. But just as a basic impression of the beer, it's got a lovely big floral character to it, big oily, juicy, fruity notes, and you've also got a balance of kind of sweetness and bread in the malt base here so it goes together really nicely in that regard but let's pick out let's let's kind of dissect the aroma a little bit more in depth before we actually taste the beer so um yeah backbone of this one then you absolutely get a little bit of a kind of bread crusty character out of this one you can smell that just forming the backbone of the beer it's almost like a kind of fresh hedgehog roll just with that little bit of flour left on it you can certainly get that uh, type of thing out of this beer but on top of that, there is, um, <clears throat> yeah, on top of that, you've got a bit of a kind of smooth white bready character. The bready character in this one, for me, it has a teeny little bit of wholemeal note to it, but mainly it's a, a big white bready character that you get out of this beer. But it absolutely smells um, very, very nice. Um, yeah, it does have quite a significant bready backbone to it, and the more that I smell of the beer, the more that that comes out. So that's interesting, yeah, a bit of bread crust, a bit of brown bread, and then a, a fair little bit of white bread to it. And then uh, this one does incidentally only contain barley malt. That's one of the main differences between the West Coasters and the New Englands, is that the New Englands contain oat and wheat malt quite often, sometimes a bit of rye, of course, over in the States. But uh, the West Coast IPAs, while it's not unheard of to put a little bit of oat or a little bit of wheat in them, they are overwhelmingly uh, barley malt beers. Um... But yeah, the the aroma out of this one on this the sweet side of the malt base is very nice. So for me, it has a little bit. You do get that kind of oily, sweet caramel from it. It's quite a bright caramel on this one. Sometimes you can get a wee bit of a kind of darker uh, caramel out of the beer. But for me, it's a very bright, slightly sweet caramel on there. There's some nice McVitie's digestive biscuity notes to it, uh, and yeah, I really like how that goes together. So yeah. Sweet, oily caramel, a little bit of a kind of 
Um, little, yeah, a little bit of a kind of almost. I do almost get a wee bit of a kind of like slightly fudgy note or something out of this, which is kind of interesting. It's almost got a little bit of that Werther's original type vibe to it. But yeah, definitely a, a sweet, bright caramel on there. A little bit of an almost fudgy, caramelly note. And you've also got that kind of McVitie's digestive biscuity sort of thing uh, coming out of this one. So I really like, I do really like how this beer goes about its uh, goes about its business. So um, yeah, I think the malty side of things in this is very, very nice. Um, there's maybe one or two other little sub aromas in there, but they're quite difficult to pick out. It is mainly nice and bready and nice and kind of sweet and caramel. It is more along the lines of, you know, like a Pliny the Elder type West Coast rather than a Sierra Nevada Torpedo. So it's got, the more that I smell of it, the more kind of bready and sweet caramel and stuff like that it becomes. But uh, yeah, I do like how this beer goes about its business from, from that perspective. So it gets a thumbs up from, uh, it gets a thumbs up from me actually on that side of things. But let's focus on the hoppy side of the beer then. We've covered the malty side of it quite extensively so far. So on the... Um, yeah, on the the malty side of things then, uh, or the hoppy side of things, brain's not working. So on the hoppy side of things then, we'll look at the green component first. I do get a little touch of earthiness out of this one, and I think that's most likely to come from the Columbus in this. Columbus does give you a wee bit of earthiness, but of course that takes a bit of a back seat. But the green component in this one is... Does it has got a bit of pungency to it, but it's not overly so, I guess we could say. So you can smell a little bit of that deeper kind of pine resiny note, but you can also smell a bit of the more kind of spicy floral aromatic note. So you're getting a wee bit of the Chinook show in its head and a wee bit of the Columbus show in its head. But on the, the front of the nose, you've got a little bit more grassiness to it, a wee bit of zestiness. So I would suspect that that's coming a little bit more from the, the Amarillo and maybe the Centennial as well. But one thing I will say about this beer is that the green component isn't overly pungent. Now we need to remember that West Coast IPAs back in the day always relied on a lot of early edition hopping. Um, and you know they, they will have late edition hopping and dry hopping as well, whereas New England's only have late edition and dry hopping, not so much in the way of early edition. So yeah, early edition hopping is, is responsible for the most of your bitterness. Late edition hopping gives you a little bit of bitterness, but mainly flavour and aroma, then dry hopping is completely flavour and aroma properties that you'll get out of the hops. But anyway, this one, the green component doesn't smell too pungent, but the where I was going with this is that you have to remember the modern generation of craft beer drinker has got into IPAs on New England IPAs. So a lot of modern West Coasters that you'll find don't have the same big bitterness from early edition hopping that they would have had back in the day. So I'm curious to see how this actually works out in the flavour of this one. But I think we've said everything about the green component. Let's look at the fruity side of the beer. So for me, this one, um, it's interesting because you do get a little bit of the kind of tropical note out of this. You can smell there's a wee bit of passion fruit and a wee bit of mango in there. Um, and it's quite, it is quite interesting uh, from that perspective because I do almost get some of the slightly red fruity figgy notes that you get from the, um, that you get from Cascade actually in this one. Um, so there's no cascade in this beer, of course, but it does say on the label there's a little bit of sugar in there. And I know from a couple of guys that uh, do home brewing who used to brew West Coast IPAs, they used to put a little bit of like a plum sugar or something like that in the beer just to give you a wee touch of a kind of red fruity flavour. So I know that's the techniques that's used. And uh, I'd be curious to know if that's what's going on here, because as I say, you get a little bit of the passion fruit, a little bit of the juicy mango. But underneath that, you just get this slightly cascadey kind of almost slightly figgy note out of the beer. But yeah, that's interesting. But you do get a lovely big oily orangey character out of this one from the from the Amarillo, absolutely. And then I don't get so much of a kind of lemony zest in the aroma, which you would have expected from Centennial. But this beer, as I say, the aroma is, um, is very, very nice for a West Coaster. It's got everything that I would want and it certainly sets off my kind of nostalgia sensors, if we like. But yeah, uh, I think we, we've said everything we need to about the aroma of this beer. So let's um, have a look at it and see how we go. You can see it has got a little bit more hazy since I poured the last little bit of it in. So um, yeah, there we go. There we go, I get very excited about West Coast IPAs, but there we are. So yeah, this one is the Big Ideas number 26, a West Coast IPA at 7.2% ABV from Simple Things Fermentations in the south side of Glasgow. My first beer from them. Let's get stuck in. Slanja, Skull, cheers. Mm. 
Ooh. That's quite nice, actually. That is quite nice. I'm going to say it is kind of what I expected it to be from the aroma. It's got quite a nice big bready uh, note to it, I have to say. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. You do get this kind of bread crusty, grainy character out of this one in the aftertaste. So, yeah, it's, it's not quite as uh, straight shooting as I thought it was going to be. So that is pretty interesting, I have to say. Um, yeah, and th this must be what Bilko was meaning. Uh, what Billy was saying is that it does have a wee bit of a kind of twist to it, in a sense. So, yeah, that kind of, it almost has a little, it's like a West Coast IPA, but it's just got a little bit of a kind of slightly farmhousey vibe to it. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. But, yeah, you will notice that that kind of comes out in the aftertaste. So, yeah, very, very interesting how that, that goes together. It has a very kind of raw sort of uh, homebrewed type vibe to it almost. So that is quite interesting. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting because we saw a lot of residue from the from the, the, the sedimentation obviously in this one. I maybe should have try, tried it uh, without that and then with it to see. But yeah, this one, it really does have, it does give you that kind of slightly yeasty kind of farmhousey vibe to it. So I, as I say, I heard from Billy that that was this beer really had a little bit of a twist to it, and it does mark it itself, if I remember rightly. It did say it was a West Coast IPA with a little bit of a kind of twist to it. Um, it's Maris Otter malt that's in this one. I forgot to mention that. It does say it's Maris Otter and Carapils that are in this one, and it's, I, know it's um, I think it's English malt that they used, or an English malt company that they used to, uh, to, make the, to get the malt for this one. But it is a pretty interesting beer, I have to say. Um, So yeah, I think the um, this one, as I say, it leans toward that more bready end of the West Coast spectrum, um, and it has the sweetness and everything you'd expect, and the big hoppy notes. It's not madly bitter right enough, but it does have just this kind of farmhousey yeasty type vibe to it, which is kind of uh, is kind of interesting. And as we say. Um, Simple Things Fermentations is about trying kind of random stuff with beer. That's what the whole vibe of this company is about. So we need to bear that in mind with it. But uh, yeah, let's try and break the flavour of this beer down a little bit and describe it for you a wee bit more in depth. So we'll focus on the middle third of the palate first off. So middle third of the palate then, you've got this base of bread crust. And it's actually quite a dry bread crust that you get with this. You can feel in the middle of your palate that it really is quite drainy and quite dry, quite grainy and dry. It's almost a little bit like a kind of. My dad always likes these morning rolls, these these kind of it's like the well fired, you know, the ones you can knock and they make a sound. He likes these morning rolls. The the backbone of this beer really reminds me of those, just a slightly more well fired bread roll actually. So that's what's sitting there. Uh, on top of that. I start to get a little bit more of a kind of brown bready vibe to the beer. I don't know if I'd describe it as wholemeal, but certainly a wee bit more kind of brown bready. And then on top of that, there's a kind of brighter, uh, kind of white bready vibe about this one. So this beer, as I say, it really has that bread crusty, brown bread, white bread base. And it's actually quite dense. The bready characters that you get out of this beer are really quite dense in a sense. But yeah the I think the um yeah I think I think on top of that you start to get um you know you start to get one or two little kind of Jacob's cream crackery sort of vibes out of this beer and one or two little woody notes as well. So again, as I say I suspect in the middle third of the palette I suspect this is what Billy was talking about with this one. Um it's certainly not quite as sweet as I thought it was going to be from the aroma but sitting on top of that bready layer you do get a bit of a circle in the middle of your palate so you can feel there's a little bit there's a yeah there's a kind of nice circle in there yeah there's a nice sort of circle in there and you have a little bit of a kind of like McVitie's digestive there's like a little bit of a kind of a McVitie's digestive base to it like that biscuity base but then as you move further toward the center 
of that circle, you get a little bit of a Werther's original kind of butterscotchy, butter candy type vibe to it. But then in the dead centre of the palette, you do get quite a sweet, bright caramel. Um, at 7.2% ABV, you would expect a little bit of booziness from this one, but I think it's actually covered up by the kind of bready, bread crusty vibe that you get out of this beer. So yeah, this one's really interesting. It's almost like a slightly farmhousey West Coast IPA. So yeah, um, and I, I wasn't expecting that from this because the aroma was really akin to, you know, the old hardcore IPA or whatever. So yeah, that's it's, that's an interesting point to make about this beer. It really has this kind of farmhousey sort of vibe to it, which is interesting. So it's, it's quite an unusual West Coast IPA. And as I say, I suspect that's what Billy kind of meant with this one. But I don't think there's anything else we really need to say about the middle third of the palette. Let's focus on the back third of the palette then. So the border region between middle third and back third of your palette. You get a little bit of a bready build up there. Again, it's bread crusty. The base of the back third of the palette is that, you know, really dry, slightly toasty, well-fired bread crust. But on top of that, you get more of a kind of grainy, brown bready character out of it. Then you get the slightly more dense, white bready vibe to the beer as well. But, um, yeah, I think that that, I think that does go together. Yeah, I think that really does go together quite nicely in, uh, in this one. But as I say, it feels a little bit more greeny and bitter again on that back third of the palette. But sitting on top of all that, you get the yeasty character out of the beer. And for me, the yeasty side of things, it's a slightly more dense, a big, dense, kind of uh, brown, bready sort of vibe to it. There's a little bit of bread crust surrounding it as well, of course. And uh, yeah, I think, again, it works pretty well. So yeah, you've got that big, dense, brown, bready vibe to the beer on top of that. That's from the yeasty side of things. But you do get this kind of woody, crackery kind of vibe there as well. And that sits on top of everything. So on the back third of the palate, you can feel the flavour is definitely taller. And then as you come further forward into the middle third of the palate, it just squashes down and condenses together a bit more, actually. So yeah, I really like how that, that goes together in this one. So it's a big thumbs up uh, from me in that sense. But let's um, have a little look at the... Pardon me, let's have a little look at the hoppy side of things. In, uh, in this one. Uh, I think that's everything we need to say about the malty yeasty side of the beer. So back corners of the palate you do get a little bit of an intense earthiness there but as you move further forward, as you move further forward the um, you do get a little bit of herbal character but then very quickly you start to get that deep um, piney resinous note and some uh, from the, which is obviously from the Chinook. So I think Chinook and Columbus in this one are being used as the, as the bittering hops, the early edition hops. But as you move towards the front corners of the palette, um, you've got a wee bit more of a kind of floral, aromatic -y side to this beer. It's a wee bit spicy as well, but round the front curve of the palette, it's a little bit lighter and more grassy and you get a slight zestiness coming out of the beer as well. So yeah, I like, I do like how that, that goes together too. I would say that it does have a wee bit of that pungency in its green component that you would expect from a more West Coasty type IPA. But as I say, this one, it really has this just kind of farmhousey, bready, yeasty sort of thing going on. So yeah, a West Coast IPA with a twist, I think is a good way to describe this one, that's for sure. But um, yeah, interesting stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think that's everything about the green component. Let's focus on the front third of the palette and the fruity side of things then. So, the border region between front third and middle third of your palette, again, a little bit of a bready build-up there. Yeah, a little bit of a bready build-up. Wee bit of, um... A little bit of a bready build-up, wee bit of a kind of, um... Bread, like, brown bready bread crust thing, but then on the base of that front third of your palette, it's, like a, it's more a kind of smooth brown bready kind of vibe that you get with this. And then sitting on top of that, you get that nice kind of oily, um, you get that nice kind of oily, uh, fruity character that you would expect from this beer as well. So yeah, I can certainly appreciate how that goes together. Hmm. Well, fire brigade will be out then. But uh, yeah. Um. Anyway, let's focus on that fruity side of the beer. So yeah, that I would say as well, you still get a little bit of this kind of 
toasty. The further you go into the taste with it, you get a little bit of that toasty, bread crusty kind of thing out of the beer that I was talking about earlier. So you can feel that in the base at the front third of the palate. But then on top of that, you get the big oily, fruity character I was talking about too. So toward the back of that front third of your palate, you get a more pungent, um, as we say, you get a little bit more of a kind of pungent um, bread crust. You do get a little bit of that more kind of pungent, passion fruity kind of thing, which I suspect is from the summit. As you come further forward, it mellows out to be a little bit more kind of uh, mango, if you like, but you can... You do get the, the fruity character on this one is actually just as I kind of described from the aroma. You do get a little bit of that sort of almost slightly figgy red fruity thing underneath, which I suspect is from some kind of fruity sugar that's been put in this beer. But then as you move into the front half of that front third of the palate, you get that oily, zesty, orangey character from the Amarillo, but a wee bit more of a kind of lemony, zesty kind of um, character. You do get that lemony, zesty sort of thing from the centennial actually so yeah the way that that goes together is very very nice so it gets a thumbs up from uh, from me on the fruity side of things but yeah kind of interesting with all the bready character that sits underneath it but i think that's everything we need to say about the flavor of this beer let's round off with a look at the the mouthfeel then so mouthfeel wise that is kind of what you'd expect from the style it pushes toward the top end the mid-bodied the carbonation is quite smooth, it has a bit of oiliness to it, which is again what you expect from the style. So yeah, it gives you everything about that. But as I say, the big thing about this beer is the way that the malty and yeasty side of things comes together. It does have that big bready yeasty kind of thickness to it. So I like, I do like that about this one. So keep that in mind with it. So yeah, as I say, nice big kind of smooth. Um, Ready, sort of, yeah, big kind of smooth, ready, yeasty kind of vibe to this beer. But the malt waste does have a slight degree of sweetness to it as well. Uh, the green component, as I say, has a wee bit of pungency. I think this is maybe about a 50 IBU beer. I don't find this one overly bitter, but 50, maybe 60 IBUs. Remember back in the day, the West Coast IPAs used to be like 80 or whatever. So it does have a wee bit of the bitterness, and the fruity side of it is a little bit more kind of oily as well. So you've got a mix between the kind of tropical notes and the more kind of zesty, orangey type things as well in this one. So, um, yeah, it's interesting how this beer goes about its business. I can see what Billy meant with it being a West Coast IPA with a bit of a twist to it. So, um, yeah, interesting stuff from Simple Things Fermentations. So I think we can leave it at that for this review. So, yeah, my very first beer from them, and it's certainly got me curious about some of their others. So, yeah, this one is the... Uh, this one was the Big Ideas number 26, the West Coast IPA, from Simple Things Fermentations in the south side of Glasgow. And I definitely look forward to the other beer that I've got from them. I think it's a Scotch Ale, if I remember rightly, like a 70 or an 80 shilling, if I remember rightly. So you'll see that reviewed in a couple of weeks' time. But yeah, this was really interesting. So again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Simple Things Fermentations as well. And we will no doubt return to these guys at some point in the uh, in the near future. So uh, yeah, catch you guys on the next one. Slanger, Skull, cheers, and big shout out to the guys at Bilko and Brenny's podcast. Check out the link to them in the video description below. Slanger just now.